It's our great pleasure today to have with us Professor Srikant uh, from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he's the Frederick and Elizabeth Nearing Endowed Professor of ECE in, at the Coordinated Science Lab. He's also one of the co-directors co of the C3.AI Digital Transformation Institute. So you may have heard of the C3DTI, he's, uh, he's co-directing that. It's a consortium of universities. Uh, Srikant's interests are in uh, M machine learning, and he's also had an extensive experience in communication networks and applied probability. Among many other achievements, he's the winner of the 2019 uh, IEEE Koji Kobayashi Computers and Communications Award, uh, the Infocom Achievement Award, as well as many, many several uh, uh, best papers, including the 2015 Infocom Best Paper Award and the Wyop Best Paper Award. He's also a distinguished alumnus of the uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. Uh, please do welcome Srikant. Thank you, Srinivas, for that kind introduction. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, the title of my talk today is going to be the role of look ahead and approximate policy evaluation uh, in policy iteration with linear function approximation. It's a mouthful. Essentially, it's a talk on uh, approximate dynamic programming or reinforcement learning, whatever you want to call it. Um, so this is uh, joint work with my PhD student, Anna Winicky, and uh, uh, two others who are uh, both at Sandia National Labs, Joseph Lubars and Michael Livesey. Okay, I think, uh, uh, I'm sure you've taken the LIPS course or uh, uh, Kumar's uh, uh, um, uh, stochastic control course, and you probably know uh, uh, much of the background, the basics. So, but just to make sure that everybody is on the same page, uh, I think most of you know what reinforcement learning is. So you have an agent, an agent takes an action, and the action affects the state of the environment. For example, if you're in an autonomous driving vehicle, then your relative position with respect to the other cars in the in, in your environment changes. So that's would be called the state of the system. And then you observe a reward, uh, uh, you observe the state as well as you observe the observer, uh, you, you get to know the reward. For example, you might uh, get a negative reward for getting too close to another car or positive reward for, for driving you know, faster, for example, and so on, because that lets you get to the destination. And so based on the observations of the state and the reward, you, you again uh, take another action. And, and reinforcement learning is about how to learn to take such actions based on observations. Um, so the optimal control policy, control policy here is basically based on your uh, state of the system. You have to learn what action to take. For example, again, in the context of an autonomous driving vehicle, you decide whether to accelerate and move forward or decelerate and, and, and uh, uh, move, you know, uh, uh, stay a little further back from the car in front of you, or you can take a right turn, or uh, I'm sorry, you can change to the right lane or the left lane or take an exit. Uh, so there are many, many, possible actions that you can take, and you do this based on the information that you receive about the state that you are in, okay? In principle, uh, one can find the optimal control policy using what are called tabular methods. So basically, again, in principle, I can store uh, uh, what action I should take in each state of the, of the system, but this is, this is just uh, uh, impossible to do in very large state space problems. Uh, for example, much of the impressive successes of machine learning is in the context of uh, board games, for example, chess or Go. And chess, the number of board positions is, Shannon computed it, and uh, this is called the Shannon number for chess. It is approximately 10 raised to the power of 120. So there is no way you can figure out or you can store for all possible uh, uh, positions of the chess board what, what actions you should take or equivalently, what would be the value of taking a particular action, which would then help you determine what action you should take. And, and so, so this is impossible. So, so therefore people resort to what is called function approximation. And that's sort of the primary uh, focus of my talk. So, so to deal with uh, uh, very large state spaces and reinforcement learning problems, people use a bunch of tricks. So they go by different names, something called look ahead, something called rollout, something called M-step return. And then they use partial implementations of gradient descent instead of doing a you know, gradient descent is something you might have learned in an optimization class, but instead of doing a full gradient descent, you might do one step of gradient descent uh, uh, every now and then, for example. And, and so what I want to understand, uh, uh, the, the goal of this talk, uh, the, the, the uh, reason we started doing this work was I wanted to understand 
you know, what, how do all of these tricks uh, uh, help in, in making algorithms converge or, you know, give you good answers and so on. And, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to restrict my attention to what is called linear function approximation. I will make some comments on how to extend the results to neural network based approximations later. Okay. And uh, in this talk, I'll primarily focus on uh, um, uh, what is called approximate dynamic programming, where I'm assuming that the model is known, but it's very large to use standard techniques used to study Markov decision processes or dynamic programming. For example, in chess, the model is known. I mean, I know exactly what is going to happen, what the new state is going to be. My move my pawn one step, you know, by 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 one square, right? So I know the state of the chessboard is going to remain the same except for this pawn moving one step. So I know exactly what each action is going to do, right? So there's nothing random in this problem, and and I know exactly the model. So I know I know each action results in this new state. Um, so, but in the, for the talk, I'm going to assume that the model is given, meaning that I'm going to be allow it to be more general, that I have a Markov decision process, the actions could lead to random state transitions, but I'm going to assume that the probability transition matrix is known. So it is like knowing that in chess, if I make a particular move, I know what the next state is, right? So the model is known and many of the RL success stories that you've heard of, such as game playing, fall into this category. But the main difficulty is that you can't solve the MDP using techniques that you learn in a, in a first course in stochastic control, such as value iteration or policy iteration and so on. And so you have to resort to approximate techniques. And the goal of this talk is to try to understand why these approximate techniques are implemented with a lot of bells and whistles and how do they help in, in, in making your algorithm converge. By the way, if you have a question, just please unmute yourself and, and ask me anytime. Uh, uh, we don't have to wait till the end. If you have any questions, you can uh, stop me anytime. Okay, so uh, I want to uh, uh, just briefly mention, and it's of course a massive number of work, uh, uh, numbers of works in this area. So, so I can't really go over everything, but I just wanted to mention three uh, 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 pieces of work that are sort of most relevant to what I'm going to talk about. So there are two recent books by Dimitri Bersikas, uh, one on reinforcement learning and optimal control, and another one. I think it's got AlphaGo in the name itself. It's an it's a ongoing book. It's a, a book in progress. And so these, these two books are very good um, uh, starting points. Basically, tell you, they tell you the state of the art and, and uh, uh, give the very, very good overviews of the various techniques that one can use to do approximate dynamic programming. Uh, and and uh, uh, another piece of work is the paper by Efroni Dalal. Scherer and Manor, which won the best paper award in AAAI in 2019. And uh, there, uh, this paper really looks at, you know, how, it, you know, approximations and policy improvement and policy evaluation steps of policy iteration, which if you know what, what that is, then you'll understand what I'm talking about, but, but otherwise I will talk about, talk about them more. Um, so, so, so we, we, we try to understand, uh, so basically this paper by Efroni, Dilal, Scherer and, and Manor. Uh, so they study, the, uh, some of the tricks that are used in, in actual reinforcement learning environments. But one thing they don't do is study function approximation, which is critical uh, because without function approximation, no reinforcement learning work will be computationally feasible. Um, uh, but and nevertheless, it's the, the Efroni et al. 2019 paper is an interesting paper. And then going way, way back in 1997, there are some interesting counterexamples by Tsitsiklis and Van Roy that illustrate the lack of convergence with function approximation. All of these will be relevant to my talk and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, uh, get into them in more detail as, as we progress. Okay, so now I've come to my model. So I'm gonna assume I have a Markov decision process. I'm assuming finite state and action spaces. A mu will be used to denote a policy and the goal is to maximize total discounted reward. Okay, so alpha is a discount factor, R is the uh, uh, reward function, and alpha is a discount factor, and P is a probability transition kernel. Right? So uh, um, just a few other notations, the optimal policy and the optimal cost associated with the optimal policy is, is given by this expression, and it can be solved as uh, 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 the solution of a fixed point equation. I think that those of you have taken a course in um, uh, MDPs or stochastic control would know this. And the way the value function is computed is 
uh, either you can solve for the optimal value function by looking at this Bellman equation, or for a fixed policy, you have a similar uh, um, uh, approximate, uh, similar similar fixed point equation. Okay, uh, but for much of the talk, I'm going to for for illustration purposes, I'm, I'm going to assume you basically you have a very large dynamic programming graph, you have to solve a dynamic programming on problems. So, so the probability transitions themselves even are not that relevant to the problem. So if you're not very familiar with MDP's theory, then, then you're still okay. Okay. So I'm going to focus on what is called approximate policy iteration, which is precisely what is implemented in, in many of these well-known uh, reinforcement learning algorithms. So before I get delve into it, I'm gonna talk about policy iteration, something again that most of you know, but just to uh, uh, make sure that we are all on the same page. And uh, uh, so, so what is policy iteration? So at each step, you have a value function, which is basically the value associated with a particular state. And using this value function, you obtain a greedy policy and then evaluate the policy to obtain a new value function, okay? So pictorially, in the case of deterministic transitions, what this means is that associated with each state is what is called the value, okay, associated with each state. And, and uh, given this value, what I try to do is find what is called a greedy policy. What, what do I mean by a greed, greedy policy? So what I do is, so, so assume that the value is associated with each of these nodes is correct. So let's say you're currently in state x0. So there are four possible actions which can put you in one of these four states that are four, four. So X1, the state X1 can take on one of four values. So how do you determine which of these actions to take? What you would do is that add the uh, reward from taking this action plus the reward that you can get starting from X1. So it's an addition of these two. And then there are four possible actions. So you add, add this to this, this to this. So there are four possible choices and then you take whichever action gives you the largest reward. So this is greedy in the sense that this is called greedy policy because uh, um, basically you're assuming that the value associated with these nodes are given to you somehow, and then you're taking the greedy action based on that. Okay. And after doing all of this, so one of these would be considered the optimal action. And so the policy associated with X0 is that if you're in state X0, then you know you have to take that policy, assuming that these value functions are correct, okay? Now, the next step is policy evaluation, right? Uh, sorry, I'm gonna hide the, oops. Okay, um, so, so next is policy evaluation. Once you fix a policy, then you just basically follow the policy and then, and then you go along a particular path and then you can calculate what the, uh, uh, reward associated with the policy, okay? But the problem is this is not implementable because to compute the value associated with every node, you either you have to solve a fixed point equation, okay? Or in practice, what people do in, in things like AlphaGo is that you start at a node and then you follow the policy along a path and then keep adding all the rewards, okay? But neither of these is feasible. I mean, you have to do this for every node in the network. And as I mentioned earlier, the number of, nodes in chess, the number of states in chess is 10 power 120. So you can't do policy iteration. So what do you do? So uh, uh, just to summarize, policy iteration basically says that if you're given a estimate of the value function, you try to find a policy in a greedy fashion. And then for that policy, you compute the, the uh, you, you evaluate the value function for that particular policy. And this is infeasible when the state space size is large. Okay, so what do you do? Okay, so two possible solutions, which I'll go over, is called linear function approximation and look ahead. So these are things that are used in practice. Instead of using linear function approximation, they use nonlinear function approximation. So what is linear function approximation? So, so, so first I'm going to talk about something called M-step return. So there are two difficulties in, in, in implementing policy iteration. One is you have to evaluate the value function associated with the policy, okay? And the way we deal with that is that the value function satisfies a fixed point equation, which basically says that t mu j minus j mu is equal to zero. So for those of you who know contraction mappings and so on, so you can, you can solve this fixed point iteration by repeated substitution. And, and uh, uh, so, so what, what you do is that instead of, instead of solving this problem exactly, 
instead of trying to solve the fixed point equation exactly. So what you do is that, uh, so maybe it's actually easier to uh, uh, explain it in a picture. So you have a particular policy and you have to evaluate the value function associated with the policy. So if you are in this state, the value function associated with the policy is basically you follow the policy, keep adding all the rewards and go all the way to termination. For example, in chess or something like that, there will be a terminal state. Basically, somebody either wins or loses or there is a draw, right? But instead of doing that to, for computational complexity reasons, you might just expand the, expand the path up to some level. For example, in this illustration, I'm taking m equal to three, okay? So that would be the equivalent of doing applying the Bellman operator three times repeatedly to, to the current value function, okay? So this is approximate policy evaluation because you're not going all the way to the end and you're just going part way and then assume that that is your current estimate of the value function, okay? But even if you do this, this does help dramatically to reduce the computational complexity, but you have to do this for every node in the network, but the number of nodes is huge. So what do you do? So you compute, uh, uh, um, so you assume that there is something called a feature vector associated with each node, okay? And what you do is that the only thing you don't know is that this parameter theta. So, so we, I'm gonna assume that the value function is of the form theta transpose phi i, okay? And this is what is called the linear function approximation. In practice, you use neural networks to do this, and I, I'll go over that later. And so the goal is to estimate theta. And how do you estimate theta? So what you do is that as you're going along a path, following a policy, okay, then basically along this policy, uh, you have an estimate of the value function. So if you are here, for example, then you, you go three steps down and then add up all the rewards and then make that the reward for this node, okay? So you, don't, you can't do the, afford to do this for every node in the network. So you basically we have done one approximation already instead of going all the way to the end. So for example, if you're playing chess, what is the reward? The reward is only obtained at the very end, right? Whether you won or lost, okay? But on the other hand, if somebody tells you there is a, a value function associated with each position, what I could do is that, you know, run my algorithm for a few steps, assume that the value function associated with that state is the correct state, and then I'll just take that to be the value function of my state. So basically you compute the value function of, of, of uh, an approximate value function for, for several states, or approximate value for several states, and then basically solve the least squares problem to figure out, so these are our estimates for, for, for the value. And then basically we are approximating it by some phi times theta. So the goal is to estimate theta. So by, by instead of, so this allows you to generalize the value function estimates for a few nodes to all the nodes. Is that clear? Basically, what we are, what I'm saying is that, in 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 reality, you need to estimate the value function for every node in the network. But instead, what you do is estimate it at a few nodes, and then complete it for the rest of the uh, 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 nodes by assuming that uh, the value function uh, is, is a linear approximator, it, it is given by a linear approximator. Okay, so that is the basic idea. So the question then is, so so what I'm saying is that. Policy iteration has two steps. One is a policy evaluation step, followed by followed by a, 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 a policy improvement step. So I've now talked about for policy evaluation, you can do two approximations. Instead of computing the policy uh, policies uh, value function exactly, you compute it only for a, for a few nodes and then assume that there is a linear relationship between the value values at all the nodes and then estimate the parameter theta. So the question is, does such an algorithm converge? In fact, there is an interesting result due to Tsitsiklas and Van Roy, and basically we modified that, that example to show that in general, this does not converge, okay? So, so in general, this does not converge, and the example is very, very simple. So you have a MDP where there are two policies, and one policy takes you from state X1 to X2, and another policy, if you start in state X1, you stay, stay there, and, and if you start in X2, you stay there. I'm not gonna go through the details of this uh, uh, counter example, but for this counter example, you can prove that uh, 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 convergence does not occur. So where does that leave us? So this is our first result, which says that, so remember there are two approximations in the policy evaluation step. Uh, sorry, in, 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 yeah, right, in the policy evaluation step. So basically instead of computing the value function for all the nodes, you compute it at a few nodes. And even for the few nodes that you compute, you only 
expand your dynamic programming tree to a depth of M and basically assume that that basically gives you an estimate of the value function. Yeah. What we show in the first result is that if this uh, 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 expansion of the tree is carried out to a depth of M, where M depends both on your discount factor, mild leads of the log one over alpha form, and on the feature set. So delta one is basically is some function of the uh, linear function approximation here. Okay, these are called feature vectors. So it's a function of how well you're representing your states using feature vectors and your discount factor. And if this condition is met, we can prove that there's convergence. So the counter example, as in the Van Roy's cyclist paper doesn't uh, apply anymore. So if you expand the dynamic programming tree sufficiently far, which is what exactly happens in, in, in a practical uh, uh, reinforcement learning algorithms, then you have convergence. But you still have another problem. So you have convergence, but you're not converting to, converging to the right value. So what we can show is that the difference between the value function of your policy that you get after running this algorithm forever and J star, which is the optimal value function, is something which becomes small, but never goes to zero, even if you expand, expand your value, uh, uh, policy evaluation, dynamic programming, uh, the, the, the expansion of the tree is carried to a depth of M. Even if you make M go to infinity, this doesn't go to zero. So the question is, can we do better? And so this is where another trick that is used in practice, uh, it turns out to this be- This is because the, um, uh, prob the, the underlying dynamics is nonlinear. So for example, if you assume that the dynamics can be represented as a linear function, linear function, then will you be able to get that CM to go to zero? Uh, no, uh, as far as I, uh, I, don't, I don't believe that it will go to zero. Um, but, but I will tell you what will make it go to zero. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll tell you what it, what it makes to go to zero. So, so it's, this is basic. So basically what it's saying is that, okay, so to answer your question better. So I guess what it's saying is that letting M go to infinity improves the policy evaluation step, but still you're doing a function approximation on top of it because you're not evaluating the policy at every node. You're only evaluating the policy at some nodes and completing for the rest of the nodes using function approximation. So function approximation puts a fundamental limit on how well you can do it. It can never make it go to, because you're not evaluating the policy exactly by the, by, uh, you will never, so you okay. So by you're evaluating the policy exactly for some of the nodes, but, but even if you evaluate the policy exactly for some of the nodes that doesn't help because you're not evaluating the policy for all the nodes and you're using function approximation. So you need something else in the policy improvement stage to make it work. Is that clear, Philip? Yes, but like if the underlying MDP itself is linear, then the linear function approximation will exactly represent the true optimal value function. Ah, okay. If you if you happen to be lucky, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so basically, you're saying that if there is representability using my yeah. using the feature vectors, correct. Yeah, then then it'll work, of course. Uh, assuming that, uh, well, you still have to assume that the nodes that you evaluate the function at, at each step will uh, uh, forms the, the uh, forms a complete basis and the feature the vector function, should, yes. yeah, should, should, should should be uh, should have full rank yeah in that okay. case yeah. correct thanks professor may i ask you a question <clears throat> sure uh in the in the so in the chess problem so it seems that we're playing a chess mm -hmm. uh, with some artificial offnet Mm -hmm. uh, with some artificial intelligence, uh, for example, and like, uh, and we don't know what the what kind of strategy uh, the, our opponent will follow. Yeah. So, so the, is the strategy of the opponent is that considered as an environment? No. Because it's not no, something no, that so, we so, control. So, no, 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 no. So, so there, I think one should look at a game theoretic version of this. What I am doing, yeah. So, so I am restricting myself to a single player situation here. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but I believe that all of these will should extend to 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 zero sum games. I mean that's a zero sum game. Okay, if you have if you have a, a non zero sum game, then I think it could be pretty complicated if you have multiplayer games and things like that. But in the context of chess, uh, you have to make sure that uh, uh, so so in, in chess the way they train it is that you self play. I mean you play against mm, yeah you play, play against yourself yeah. So you have to extend mm. all of this to. Uh, we are working on that, and I don't think that that should provide, uh, you know, present any technical challenges here. 
also we we're assuming like self self play like playing playing against ourselves no i'm not assuming anything i'm just assuming in this particular case i'm just assuming a standard mdp but i can uh -huh. assume a zero sum mdp in which case that would model chess yeah i'm not doing that in the stock that's what i'm saying yeah so i'm not i'm not i'm not modeling a two player game in the stock but it can be i think i believe that the results here can be extended to two player games pretty easy, straight and straightforward by you will you will have to uh, talk about you know achieving some saddle point and things like that yeah so, so do you mean that are we are we assuming that the 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 strategy of the opponent is fixed no 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 there is no opponent i mean think of it as playing a tetris game uh -huh. think of it as playing an atari game or tetris oh or oh That's yeah a... oh okay gotcha so thank it you can be extended to zero so oh yeah yeah for this one, maybe atari or, 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 or yeah yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Okay. So uh, the second thing we have to do to make it work is so so we, I've already talked about you know, approximations to the policy evaluation step. In the policy improvement step, we cannot do so in policy improvement. In in for those of you who know the Bellman operator notation, you're trying to find a policy mu such that t mu j is t j, where t is the optimal Bellman operator. I'll show you pictorially what it means for those of you who are not familiar with the notation. But you have to do something called a look ahead. It's not enough to do so. Essentially, you have to raise this t to the power of h to make it work. And what we'll show is that for sufficiently large values of, basically you're doing two look ahead. One based in the policy evaluation step, you're expanding the dynamic programming tree, but also in the policy improvement step, if you, you have to uh, expand the dynamic program tree. In that case, you, you actually get good results. And this is precisely what happens in practice. Okay, this is what they do in the, in, in, if you look at the code for AlphaGo, of course, I mean, I'm not claiming that I'm explaining everything that is in AlphaGo here, but, but a lot of elements of that are, are, are in, in our model. Okay. Um, so, so the Bellman operator is just simply the right-hand side of the Bellman equation. Um, and, and if you uh, apply the Bellman operator H times, it's called eight step. Okay. So let me, let me actually show it in the form of a picture. So what, what does it, uh, uh, um, okay. So, so, what does what do I mean by uh, look ahead? So let's take h equal to two. So what this means is that ah, okay. So let's say let's say this is the uh, uh, depth two tree starting from starting from node x zero. So in a greedy policy, what you would do is that you would you would compare this action with this action, and the way you compare these two actions is basically you take the reward that you get by taking this action add it to the value function estimate of this node, add the reward from this action to the value for, for, for this action to the, to the value function estimate of this node, compare the two. Okay, so this is what is traditional policy iteration. Let me, ask, uh, uh, let me, let me discard the, right, yeah. Whereas, whereas when h equal to two, so what does look ahead mean? In look ahead, instead of just looking at one step ahead, you, you're still comparing these two actions. You have, you have to decide whether this action is best or this action is best. But to make the decision, you go down the tree a little bit. So if I take this action, there are two possible, if I take the left arrow, then there are two possible uh, uh, nodes I could end up with two, two steps from now. So I look at both possibilities and figure out which one of these four possibilities lead me to the best, uh, 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 give me the best reward and then take the next action based on it. So instead, of, instead of looking at the current reward plus what happens at the next node, you look at current reward plus the action I take in the next time instant and then add the reward of, uh, and then add the value of the, of the next day, okay? So, so, so you do a, a look ahead and then you expand your dynamic programming tree using such a, look ahead. So, so in general, you might use H is more than two clearly, but that was just an illustration. Okay. Of course, look ahead is very computationally expensive. So basically, if you, if you make H10, then basically, if, if even if it's a binary tree, then you have to search over two power 10 nodes. And so this could be, this could be, which is thousand nodes, which is not 
impossible for today's computers. But I mean, if you do 50, you do a look ahead of 50, it becomes starting to become impossible. So instead, what people do in practice is what is called Monte Carlo tree search, which is an approximation to look ahead. And theoretically, there's exponential complexity. There's a worst case complexity bound in this paper by uh, Deva Brat Shah, Jiju, I mean, Xiaomin Shea and Jiju, uh, which appeared in Sigmetrics 2019. Uh, 2020 or 2019, I can't remember. But anyway, so so and the uh, but 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 if you make some assumptions about the value function, for example, small changes in the uh, uh, state of uh, state of the system does not change the value function dramatically. So it's some kind of a Lipschitz assumption. Then there are earlier works by Chepasvari and Munoz and uh, uh, several other people who show that MCTS can be effective. So so instead of trying to figure out you know, whether the worst case complexity of, uh, uh, of uh, MCTS is what one should believe or should we assume that it has low complexity? We just assume that, so, so we are here, we don't model MCTS, we just assume that you can do eight step look ahead. I mean, in practice, it's computationally impossible to do. And so you, you resort to some approximation, but we're not modeling that approximation here. Okay, so, so what is our algorithm now? So basically what you do is that, uh, uh, um, so you evaluate the function, so at at m nodes, and then and then uh, to uh, and then you you uh, um, figure out the value function for any other node that you might encounter by assuming that it satisfies a linear function approximation, and in the policy uh, um, improvement step, you do uh, you you do the eight step look ahead. So if you do all of this, our main results says. What it says is that the look ahead in the policy evaluation step and the look ahead in the policy improvement step, if M plus H is sufficiently large, okay? The important thing is that only the sum of the look ahead in the policy evaluation and the policy improvement have to be sufficiently large. It doesn't have to be, each individual one can be, you know, so, so you have flexibility in choosing whichever one is less complicated, you can, you can, you can choose uh, that to be large for, for convergence. But on the other hand, if you want to get good policies, then really only H is the one that the policy improvement step is very important. And uh, uh, when I gave this talk at another reinforcement learning uh, workshop, um, uh, uh, Dimitri Bertsikas uh, also, also mentioned this. Um, he said in actual great gameplay, when you're actually doing a gameplay, I mean, uh, uh, people, he says that often the way reinforcement learning algorithms are trained is that you do a crude training, and then actually only it's only during gameplay that you improve its performance. So, so to improve the performance, you have to do a look ahead. So, so, so when you're playing chess, for example, you don't even if you have an estimate for the value functions of the next states, you don't you don't do you don't take the uh, 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 action that that maximizes the value of the next step, but rather you sort of look ahead 10 steps before you, before you decide what action to take. And this, this, the, the, the theory also confirms that, but, but the M also plays an important role. So M does help to reduce, the, reduce your error, but cannot make it go to zero. So there are lots of factors involved. And, and uh, one of the key things that we have pointed out in this paper is the relationship between the feature vectors, the, the function approximation, the look ahead and the policy evaluation, look ahead and policy improvement, and how all of them work together to determine uh, uh, the approximation error that you have. Quick on the question. Uh, this yeah. follows from what Dilip was asking. So, uh -huh. so essentially the look ahead uh, uh, idea of improving policy improvement with look ahead mm -hmm. somehow makes it more conducive to linear function approximation? I mean- uh, uh, Any function approximation, correct. So any, it's a, it, it, has the, it has the effect of uh, um, it has the effect of, uh, so so in practice, people use neural network-based function approximation, but you do look ahead several steps when you actually play the game. And and, and that is absolutely important to, to get good results. So uh, Why, I mean, sorry, if you can. Oh, well, I mean, so so technically, uh -huh. uh, uh, if, if H is infinity, mm. then basically you're actually solving the problem in one step. Sorry. So, so basically, uh, uh, you you have to solve an equation of this form, right? Mm. And how do you solve it? We repeatedly apply uh, uh, the, the t operators to some initial guess, mm. and the more number of times you operate, you apply it, you get closer and closer to the optimal value function. Correct. So, so the increasing h clearly should help. So, but what is interesting here is that. Increasing both H and M 
and, and, and how much you need to increase age is a function of how, how good a, a set of feature vectors that you've chosen, which is an issue with linear function approximation because you're choosing the feature vectors. But as a neural network can be thought of as vaguely thought of as choosing the right set of feature vectors for you, that's why neural networks are preferred. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, but the reason that H helps is that basically because when you're solving a, when you're iteratively solving a fixed point equation, it's like applying the uh, 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 operator multiple times. So of course, right. if H is infinity, you get the right answer. Right. So here you're actually giving bounds on what happens if you apply a H a few times. And similarly, if you apply uh, uh, the T mu a few times in the, in the policy evaluation step, what is the impact of all of this? And what this theorem says is that how much you have to do really depends on how good of a function approximation that you have. So there's a trade-off. So the larger the neural network you have, you might be able to represent functions more easily, in which case the computational complexity would be lower. But of course, the neural network itself might be difficult to store and you might need a massive cloud to store it. And the neural network itself might take some time to execute because the neural network has multiple layers, for example. If you give it an input, it'll take some time for you to give you know, the amount of value for that. The, so, this result specifically is for linear function approximation, right? Yes, yes, but, I, but I'll tell you how it extends to neural okay, networks. Okay, okay. Professor, yeah. Professor, then, then as uh, does the order matter? It, do you know what I mean? So, so what like, matter? order. So, so what I mean is that, like, I can I understood up to up to this point that yeah, that M and H, if we just co if we just adjust uh, uh, just M and H properly, uh, then we can we can have a we can have a kind of faster convergence rate. That yeah, one I understood. And good performance. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And uh, and what I but. But the question that I have is that is the order like or like do we have to like put the evaluation first or no like no I don't, well, it's it's repeated so there is no you do m you for do h you do m you do h I mean in training you do it repeatedly so you do it many many times so yeah it doesn't really matter I don't there is no order in the sense that they're repeatedly done it doesn't matter which one you start with uh oh so oh so only only m and h matters but not not really the order. Well, I mean, the, what I'm saying is that there is a fixed order. You do first the policy evaluation followed by policy improvement and you repeatedly do this. Oh, okay. oh yeah, okay, gotcha. Thank evaluation you. Evaluation improvement, evaluation improvement. So yeah. So it's a fixed yeah. Order. yeah. Is this, the, is this the, the, the look ahead in the policy evaluation, is it really crucial? Um, well, what I'm saying, it's crucial for convergence. Okay. So you need this condition. So, so you can, you can, you don't have to have look ahead and follow. You can choose M equal to one, and then you just can choose H greater than log delta. But the problem is H part is the what that adds to the computational complexity okay. because uh, that's approximated by MCTS. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so, so in practice, you don't even do this. Uh, 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 you do something even simpler. You actually use gradient descent to make the computations even simpler. Uh, um, and what do I mean by that? So what I said earlier was that you compute J hat for a few nodes and then, and then uh, 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 complete it for the rest of the nodes using linear function approximation. In practice, you don't even do that. What you do is, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know that the thing is not going away. I'm going to do it again. Okay. So, so in practice, what you do is that instead of solving this minimization problem, you don't, you just take one step of gradient descent each time. Okay, which is somewhat surprising that this will even work because the idea is that at each step you try to do, uh, uh, you try to fit the best uh, um, um, function within your function class to, the, to whatever you have evaluated. But in practice, what they do is just do one step of gradient descent. If you're using a neural network, basically one step of back propagation or a few steps. I mean, you can do three or four steps, for three or four back propagations maybe to, to compute the, uh, uh, to, to repeatedly do gradient descent maybe three times, four times, 10 times, something like that. But you don't definitely not do it to infinity. So the question is, does it work in this case? And surprisingly, what we were able to show is that it, it, the same result holds, except that now you have to choose the step size for gradient descent appropriately. If you choose the step size for gradient descent uh, uh, sufficiently small, the same result continues to work. So this might look a bit, all of this might look a little uh, 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 esoteric. And then, uh, so I want to give some intuition behind why uh, these conditions, for example, show up that M plus H is greater than 
something or so, uh, so those kind of conditions. The proofs are quite involved, so I can't go through all of the, the proofs in detail. But what I will do is I will consider a slightly different problem, approximate value iteration instead of approximate policy iteration. And it's easy to understand in the context of approximate value iteration why you need certain conditions for convergence. And, and I think the, the problem with policy iteration is that you can't just use contraction mapping arguments. You have to use monotonicity of the Bellman operator and, and uh, uh, some other uh, linearity kind of properties to, to make the proof work. But, but for value duration, things are much less complicated. And so I'll, I'll just talk about value duration. But of course, people in practice use approximate policy duration because it converges much faster. Um, okay, so, so uh, let's, let's say we do value duration. What is value duration? Applying the Bellman operator uh, uh, repeatedly in a recursive fashion. Instead of doing this, you could also do an eight step uh, uh, version of the Bellman operator. So you can do, you can, you can do recursion using TPRH, okay? So, so, so I want to talk about what happens if you do the, the, the solve the fixed point equation using TPRH. So the idea is the same as before. So I'm going to uh, uh, you know, evaluate the policy at a few nodes, okay? And then, and then I'm going to, uh, um, uh, and I'm, I'm going to apply the TPRH operator. And so together, the composition of this, the new value function can be thought of as some operator, which represents the solution of this, uh, um, which, which represents the projection into a linear space of T power H J K. So we know that uh, uh, um, T, T is a contraction mapping uh, and, and T power H is a contraction mapping with contraction parameter alpha power H. Um, so it has a stronger contraction. But what about M T power H? M T power H of course is also a contraction, is also a mapping, but it may or may not be a contraction. So basically M is something that depends on our function approximation, the ability of our, of our feature vectors to approximate the value function. So now M, so the, the contraction parameter here is the infinity norm of M multiplied by alpha power H. So if this quantity is less than one, okay, then we have, then we have convergence, otherwise we may not have convergence. So therefore, H should be chosen such that you have to compensate for the fact that you're doing an approximation to your value function. So in other words, I mean, equivalently, you can write the say saying that H should be larger than log of M, uh, the, the infinity norm of M divided by log of one over alpha. So now in our, in our uh, linear function approximation case, uh, sorry, you know, uh, yeah, I'll, yeah, sorry, go ahead, yeah. Uh, just for confirmation, uh, M means the policy evaluation, right? And T is the uh, uh, the improvement. H is the policy improvement, correct? So here I'm only considering uh, there is no policy evaluation here because I'm doing uh, um, value iteration for just the proof's sake for simplicity. So so what I'm saying is that if you do value iteration and do function approximation, you'll see that H that you need you have to do look ahead value iteration, not standard value iteration because of the presence of function approximation, you have to look ahead when you do value duration as well. And, and, and this is a sort of a simple proof that says that since you have a recursion of this form, you need M times T power H to be a contraction. So that's why you get conditions of this form. So now when you get to policy iteration, approximate policy iteration, instead of this H, you have M plus H, condition on M plus H, okay? Okay, so, uh, uh, so we considered an experimental setup. This paper, as I said, was motivated by this uh, paper by Efroni et al. And so we used a similar setup to them. Uh, you know, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, uh, I won't go through the simulations, but, but uh, the simulations confirm what we, are, what, we are, uh, uh, what we have studied. Basically, if you do tabular setting, of course you have very fast convergence, but for large problems, it's not feasible. But if you, for example, if you do random features, the features are chosen you know, randomly, for example, random Gaussian features, then, then of course, convergence is slow. Uh, you, uh, uh, you, might have, you might have lack of convergence because, because the, uh, as I mentioned, the amount of look ahead that you need to do is a function of how, how good a feature vector space that you've chosen. Whereas if you design the feature vectors with some knowledge of, of, of the problem that you're studying, then you get much better results. Uh, uh, that's basically what this, uh, uh, results are saying. I just want to very briefly talk about uh, uh, how we can extend our results to neural networks, and and there is still some work to be done. 
but let's take a, for simplicity, let me just take a single uh, hidden layer neural network. So basically I'm using ReLU neurons for those of you who know what that is. And my output is just simply a combination of the uh, uh, outputs of the ReLU neurons, uh, a linear combination of them. Um, there's something called the NPK approximation. If you're not familiar with it, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting kind of approximation. It approximates a neural network by a linear function approximation. What do they do? They essentially do a Taylor series of a ReLU. ReLU is just a positive part. And if you do a Taylor series, basically I'm looking at the first term. Of course, this is not differentiable. This is not a differentiable function, but except at the origin of the, 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 the plus function can be, the derivative of the plus function can be thought of as indicator W transpose X greater than or equal to zero times W minus W zero trans, transpose X. So this is just a first order Taylor series expansion and two of the terms cancel out. And then what you're left with is uh, uh, if, you, if I think of, x times this quantity as the feature vector, where the feature vector depends on your initial guess for the, for the, for the weights of the neural network, then this is a linear function approximation. And what you can show is that when the number of neurons becomes very, very large, it does the neural network approximates the linear function approximator, and you have to look at some reproducing, appropriate reproducing current of Hilbert space uh, uh, to do this. And, and so I believe that all of our results will go through if you do kernel linear regression, approximate neural networks by a kernel, by, by an RKHS, and, and uh, this should work. I mean, that, there's no doubt it'll work. But, but a more interesting question is that, you know, you might be interested in figuring out to get a certain degree of approximation error, how many neurons we need. And that is a more interesting question and that's something that we are still working on. I wanted to say a few things about updating along the trajectory rather than going at the end, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll stop here. Um, so just to conclude, so we analyzed, so, so in practice, because you cannot do uh, policy evaluation uh, exactly, you do it only for a few nodes. And uh, even for those few nodes, you expand the dynamic programming tree only to a certain depth. And then you complete the estimate for the rest of the nodes using function approximation. But in doing so, you cannot use the other step of policy iteration, which is policy improvement, just in, in the natural way. So you, instead of using the T operator, you have to use T raised to the power of H. The main result says that large, uh, I mean, if, if M plus H is sufficiently large then you have convergence and how large you need, uh, 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 of, of how large do you have to expand the dynamic programming tree really depends on the representation you choose. And I believe that one reason why neural networks are really good is that if you if you delete everything except the last layer of a neural network, you can think of the first 10 layers or whatever layers you have as finding a right feature representation for you. And I believe that that is basically what's what's happening, why, why these things, uh, by choosing a very good representation using a neural network, you don't have to use M, M plus H to be very large. Of course, it will be very large for us, but at least in, in at least Google's computers can do it or Google's cloud can, can, can do it. Um, and, and that's why it's a combination of look ahead and policy evaluation, look ahead and policy improvement, and a good uh, uh, neural network architecture work together to make reinforcement learning uh, algorithms work. The paper is available on archive, and uh, we are thinking of uh, some, some extensions to neural network based approximations to some stochastic noise and so on. So that's the end of my talk. And if there are any more questions, uh, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. <laughs>